in this discussion, we'll go into more detail about a concept that we've already talked about um, and you should be familiar with, and this is the idea of a secondary field. So to set this up, let's uh, review what we're, we've talked about as our primary field in Drosophila, which is these three coordinate systems that make up the three axes of a bilateral organism. Now, these are the same axes that are present in all bilateria organisms, at least at one stage or another. Some organisms like starfish, for instance, are members of bilateria, and many of them have bilaterally symmetrical larvae, but as adults, they have this kind of modified radial symmetry. But for the ground plan of bilateria, they all have these axes, and that then makes up the primary field, okay? So this picture here is a diagram of a dissected Drosophila larva. It's like if you cut it down um, the middle and then opened it up kind of like um, unrolling a um, rolled up uh, tortilla in a taco. And all of the green are muscle groups. And you can notice repeated patterns here, right? So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six muscles in that segment, the same thing there in that segment. There are these uh, longitudinal muscles, right, that help it as it worms its way through its food, that's like a peristaltic motion. But notice that we've got a very clear repeated pattern, right, within the major pattern. And so now that we have this repeated pattern, we have the opportunity for defining of secondary fields. And these secondary fields will then become organs or appendages or sensory structures like eyes. I guess an eye you could classify as an organ also. Right? And so we're going to look now at some of the details and with one specific example, the wing in uh, fruit flies, of how those secondary fields are set up. Okay? So we've got this repeated, right? because we have individual segments, coordinate system. Now, the coordinate system, what I mean, so typically when you think of coordinates, you think of like GPS coordinates, right? Um, latitude and longitude. Or maybe if you remember back to when you first learned the x and the y axis, that's called a coordinate field or coordinate plane. So coordinate is a way to set up a localization where we can pinpoint an area within a region based on any unique set of coordinates. Now here the coordinates are not um, latitude and longitude like in GPS. They're not numbers like on the x and the y axis. Rather, they are levels of gene expression. So a certain combination of different levels of gene expression that were set up first by the maternal genes and then differential genes being turned on, those uniquely identify different parts of the, of the developing animal body based on those different levels of genes. And so whatever different combination it gets is going to end up patterning a leg, for instance. And there might be more than one combination of those genes that would build a leg. And so that's how we can get both variety and stability uh, within these developing organisms. Okay, now the gene that first initiates appendage development is called distalis. And you've seen that, that's the abbreviation DLL. You've seen that gene before. So when we talked about making an insect and how UBX and abdominal A work together to repress distalis, they're repressing appendage development. And in the insect, that means that we get an abdomen without any appendages growing on it. But distalis is the general gene. In fact, this is a deep homology gene. It's used for all appendages. So distalis here is in red. And so we've got the mouth parts that show develop distalis in early forms. The antenna, the one, two, three legs, and there's this little interesting thing that looks like it's going to be a leg, maybe a remnant of an ancient a leg that then gets reabsorbed and, and perhaps plays a different role. That's not important. But the interesting thing is that when we look in um, mice, in mollusks, like the octopus growing its tentacles, even in starfish with their tube feet, or annelids, where not all annelids, but many annelids have these repeated um, structures on each of their segments, all of those are initiated by distalis. And we just this one was recognized early on that they're all called distalis, and no matter what uh, organ uh, organism they are, they are in. So distalis is an example of a deep homology gene that shows a connection. So basically, the idea is the common ancestor of all bilaterian animals had a gene, the ancestor of all of these modern copies of distalis, and that gene developed appendages. 
And so just like the ILIS pac 6 example, where the same gene initiates eye development across a wide range of animals, this same gene develops appendage development. And so it basically says grow an appendage. But the key next step is what is that appendage going to be? Is it going to be a leg? Is it going to be an antenna? And one of the primary, in fact, in many cases, the battery of genes that determines what an appendage are going to be are the Hox genes. And again, we're, we're, we're going with Drosophila, and there'll be some differences, but Hox genes play a vital role really across all organisms in appendage designation. designation. And so if you will recall, you might not be surprised about this. Remember one of the earliest homeotic mutations that we talked about in class? And it was that one where um, we grew antenna on the fruit fly in place of, or sorry, we grew uh, legs in place of antenna. And so the gene that mediates that mutation is called antennapedia. And so antennapedia is a gene that normally says grow a leg. And so if it's expressed in the wrong area of the body, if we have a mutation that expresses in the head, then we grow a leg where the antenna should be. And so that gene then becomes a designator of what each segment is going to be. Now, remember this. This is just a quick review. Why don't we see distalis expression? No red at all in most of the abdomen. There's that one little exception, abdominal one. Remember, this is because UBX and abdominal A together repress distalis. And there are some really cool stories, alternate stories. This little segment here, A1, the, it's called the pleuropodia. That's a little bit of an aside. We won't have time to do that. There are some interesting things about caterpillars, which as larvae at least have these little pseudo legs on, if you've ever seen an inchworm, right? They have kind of three little, almost like teddy bear-like legs on the back, and then the more standard arthropod legs on the front. And so there's some interesting stories in how those are done, um, and some of them we'll touch on. But remember, there is no distalis in the abdomen of insects because UBX and abdominal A work together to repress, fully repress distalis, and thus we don't get appendage development on their abdomen uh, like they did in, in all the ancestors. So within each of these repeated segments, say, hey, we're going to grow an appendage, we set up a brand new coordinate field. So the secondary field, like the developing leg or the developing antenna, that bit of tissue is called a secondary field. The wings qualify that. And really, any distinct area that's growing to be a structure or an organ with a distinct boundary, we can call it a secondary field. Okay? And to set up a secondary field, we have the same axes. So we set up a new coordinate system with different genes but in the same axes. So, for instance, in the fruit fly, the anterior to posterior boundaries of the entire fruit, fruit fly are defined by bicoid and nanos, and the diffusion of those genes and then other target downstream genes. So there's a, 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 a group of them. But bicoid and nanos are the, uh, are the original genes that begin to set up that entire, the primary field, the entire anterior to posterior axis of the developing fruit fly. So within the wing here, we also have an anterior to posterior axis, but it is defined by different genes. Okay, So the same axes, but defined by different genes that are expressed within that defined region. So it's like a little coordinate system within a coordinate system. Maybe one way to think about it, if we use um, latitude and longitude to find our position on the globe, then you could, like within a city, have a finer set where you have an address, right? Now, latitude and longitude, if you bring it out far enough, you can really define anything. That's one of the advantages of numbers. You just go to smaller and smaller um, distinctions, like you know, go to tens of thousandths of a, of a degree instead of a thousandth of a degree. And you can keep going and get very, very precise. But with our genes, we need a second system that's going to define this smaller area. So kind of like addresses in a city define where, they're, where exactly you are in the city, this new set of genes defines exactly where the cells are within this developing field. And so they know they're going to be an appendage. They may have even gotten signals that say, hey, you're going to be a wing. And then that sets up the anterior to posterior ventral to dorsal. And we don't have it pictured here. But the proximal to distal axis also, which is initiated by um, distalis, that gene, and then other genes come on to help pattern the middle region and segments and all of that. So it's a very, again, involved kind of re but so. Well, let's say it this way. 
It's a very involved, detailed process with different genes. There are, you may see some that are similar that overlap. Some genes do double duty. But by and large, different genes in the same coordinate system set up these secondary fields. Okay? And then differentiation begins. And so differentiation means how is this appendage going to be different than any other? How is a wing different than an antenna or different than a leg? And even in some cases, and this is very cool, um, let's um, let's see if I bring this up for you. Um, yeah, bring this over. So one of the th cool things about insects is they have a wide, wide range of morphologies that make them very, very cool. So I'm just going to throw out a few examples because I think this is amazing. So praying mantis, and some of you are going to be familiar with these groups. So praying mantis have the standard insect body form with a head, uh, thorax with three segments and a pair of legs on each segment, and then uh, no appendages on the abdomen. But they have these really cool modified forelegs. So they still have six legs, four for walking around and two for grabbing their prey, right? So how do we differentiate that this segment, the legs growing on this segment, are going to be different than these? And so that's something that's unique, and I don't think that's ever been defined in the mantis. That's work that yet needs to be done. And then maybe even more cool, let me show you another one that's kind of has all of the above. So grasshoppers and crickets in general have their hind legs modified into these saltatorial jumping legs. So again, that's something specific to that group. But in addition, the mole crickets, they have these big, large jumping legs in the back. They have kind of regular old walking legs, a little different than some, but not too much different. And then in the front, they have these massively modified digging legs, fossorial. And you can come up with examples over and over and over again. And in fact, there are even some really cool convergent examples. So there is a group of organisms called mantis flies. Um, <laughs> a lot of interesting things there. Uh, let's see. There, one is a wasp mimic. Ah, here we go. This is a mantis fly. And mantis flies are closely related to lacewings, which you might expect based on the image, right? It kind of looks like a green lacewing, if you're familiar with those. But they are, in some ways, uh, morphologically similar to praying mantises, and that's the name. But they're only very, very distantly related to praying mantises. So here we have, and some of them are wasp mimics, like this guy. Some of them are green lacewing mimics. So here we have a really cool example of convergence where we have raptorial forelegs that have evolved independently in different groups. And so we could look and say, hey, are they using the same genes? Are they using different genes? Uh, and we might expect some overlap of similarity, but probably significant difference since it arose independently. Here's one that's even a better um, wasp mimic. We get these down here occasionally in South Texas, but not super commonly. So anyway, insects are a really great group to work on, and there's all sorts of untold stories that have yet to be researched and discovered about how we differentiate uh, like a walking leg from a raptorial leg or a digging leg. But there has been some systems that have been well worked out, like, as you might expect, in model organisms in the fruit fly. So we're going to look at that. First, we'll look at differentiation of the wing in general, and then we're going to look at how we get different wings, because remember the Fruit flies, like all of the true flies, the diptera, have front wings that are used for flying, their front pairs of wings. And then their hind pair of wings is used for uh, basically geospatial relationships as they're flying. It's like a little gyroscope. They don't provide lift. They just provide uh, sensing about where the fly is in respect to its environment. And so how do we grow a uh, wing versus that sensory structure, which is called a haltier? So let's look at both of those. So I don't especially care that you know uh, all of the names of these genes, but there is a signal set up right along the anterior to posterior line in the developing fly wing. And if we look back here to our original diagram, notice this line, decapentaplegic, which builds up right along the midline between the anterior and posterior sides. And so right where DPP is involved, we end up with this gradient that's set up because DPP is only being made right in the middle, and it diffuses out, we get this very nice diffusion gradient with very high levels in the middle, kind of at a plateau. And then as you go farther to the anterior side or farther to the posterior side, the levels of DPP drop off. Now, there are three downstream genes. DPP targets all three of these genes. It does so, however, at different levels. At very high levels, all three of them are turned on. So in the middle, where the purple stripe is here in this stain, all three genes are being expressed. 
as we move farther away from that midline, either to the anterior side or the posterior side, there's a region where the levels of DPP fall off below a threshold and we no longer have this first gene being expressed. And so the levels are still high enough to express OMB and vestigial, right? I forget what OMB means. It's an acronym for some funky gene name, but the levels are high enough to express both of those, but fault is no longer expressed. So here, kind of in the middle on the anterior and posterior side, we have a region where we only have OMB and vestigial. And then finally, as we go farther from the midline and the DPP levels continue to drop off, we end up with only enough for vestigial to be expressed. And so we end up with these regions on either uh, the anterior and the posterior, sorry, anterior over here, posterior over there, where we only have vestigial. So this is reinforcing a, this one of these key concepts. By a single gene signal, hey, DPP made in one line and then diffusing, that's the signal, we can activate different genes in different patterns. And so we've actually defined multiple regions of the gene of the wing now. We've defined the middle region with all three, a uh, central region with two, a uh, region more towards the margins with only one gene, and then even there's a bit of the gene here on the very extreme margins with none of them. So that one signal might give us now multiple distinct areas of the gene. And in the wing, this serves for uh, helping to identify where different veins in that wing should grow. So insect wings have these reinforcing veins and then the membrane stretched between them. And this is part of the patterning from the anterior to posterior part of the, of the wing that allows for proper patterning of where those veins should grow. And so that's the, the answer, right? That what we just went over, that's how one signal uh, gets many patterns. If you wanted to nutshell it, basically you would say the, the expression of one gene and its diffusion across a gradient can cause targeting downstream targeting genes at different threshold levels and yield many different signals, many different regions that are patterned differentially. All right, so let's talk about the wings. So again, the front pair of wings in Diptera, like the fruit fly, are just called wings, or if you want to call them wild type or flying wings, the hind set here, the little h, is called the haltier. So the haltier is no longer a true wing. It's not used for, for pumping air and, and lifting you up off the ground. It's now a sensory organ, and that's been a very useful thing for flies. It's one of the things that allows them to move so quickly and acrobatically, like if you try to swat them or grab them with your hand, it's really hard, and part of that is because they can sense really in minute terms the uh, orientation of their body and how fast their body is moving and how uh, fast it's decelerating or accelerating. And the haltier plays a major role in that. So it's a cool thing that helps with the flies, but how do we, what was the change that patterned the haltier differently? Well, it turns out, as you might expect, remembering back, this is going back to some of those homeotic mutations again, that UBX is the primary answer for this. When UBX is expressed in a segment that's going to grow a wing, so coming back here, if we have an addition UBX, instead of going through all the normal steps to grow a wing, we end up going down a different developmental pathway, and instead, we grow a halt here. And so we start with the basic ground plan of a wing, but then UBX kicks it down a different pathway. And so in the mutant fly, we had turned off the expression of UBX to a level where it was actually still working because abdominal A and UBX worked together. There was still enough UBX to get rid of limbs on the abdomen, but it had dropped off enough that it no longer had its function on the haltier. And so we ended up, instead of growing haltiers, we ended up growing wings. And so if you remember the UBX mutant, uh, when the adult developed, it looked like a kind of a more ancestral version of a fly with four flying wings instead of just two flying wings. So UBX is a great example of a pleiotropic gene, right? One gene with more than one job, more than one phenotypic impact. So UBX in the fly works to both pattern the abdomen with no appendages, that typical insect abdomen, but it also serves to modify the hind wings into haltiers, a really important successful structure for flies. Okay, so just be aware of those other, and there are other things here showing, you know, regions that are sec other secondary fields. We're not going to spend time doing every single secondary field because there are lots of them. So everything from salivary glands to legs. Um, and we're just looking at the wing and then the modification of one of those. So if we look at gene expression in the halt here versus the wing, 
what we will see at early stages is they look identical. Now there's size difference here, right? So there's some other genes that are controlling growth, but notice that this gene is pretty much the same in both. This gene, the same in both. Here is DPP down the midline, the same in both. But once we get into later sets of genes, now we start seeing differential expressions because UBX has kicked the halter down a completely different pathway. So we have this gene that is expressed here uh, along the, uh, pro or the distal element of the wing, and here it's expressed only in the proximal and the halter. Here we have a patch that's here in the wing, but really nothing in the halter, and we have very different expression patterns for this gene. And so we start with a basic primary field of, hey, let's grow an appendage. Oh, it's going to be a wing, and then UBX comes in and modifies it, and essentially by you know different genes being expressed, but essentially... Uh, turns that wing into a halt here. Now, in later days, we'll look at UBX and its role in a few other insects, and it actually has a wide variety. So this is something, as you might expect, this is a function of UBX that is unique to the flies because other insects have four pairs of wings rather than just two. And so in those ones, UBX has the more ancestral. It hasn't gained this additional ability. And so that is a unique characteristic for the diptera, which only have those two pair of wings, uh, sorry, the one pair of wings, and then the one pair of haltiers.